All right, so let me get started. One of the uh, most quoted and uh, well-known phrases in English literature is to be or not to be. I'm sure you've all heard of it. To be or not to be. The, the full line is to be or not to be. That is the question. And it uh, was from um, Hamlet's play that William Shakespeare wrote in Act Chapter 3, Scene 1, <coughs> where Hamlet opens um, with those words. And, and those words were spoken by Hamlet to, well, William Shakespeare wrote it, to capture this idea of where Hamlet was um, contemplating about death and suicide, uh, all because of um, the pain and the unfairness of life. But then when he thought about the other side, he thought, oh, I don't know about if that's a good idea either, you know, to die. So he was in this turmoil, rightio. Now when I, the reason why I want to mention it to you today is because when I think of that phrase, to be or not to be, uh, there's something that resonates in me in regards to, a, as a Christian. I wonder if it does with you. To be or not to be. Like I can be, I can not be. Yeah. And this is so important when it comes to understanding Christ. If we've become Christians, if we've given our life to Jesus, called on him to save us, then there ought to be in us a desire to be. No longer not to be. We're to be the Lord's. We're to be giving ourselves to him. We are to be doing and being what Christ always wanted us to be. And this is why it's so important to, to look at this this morning. And if we choose not to be, if we ch should choose that option, then we will fade away. And our spiritual life will just, will just turn into like a little flicker, if anything at all. That's how it's going to be. If we choose not to be, then the world will engulf us. The devil will devour us and our sinful nature will control us. That's pretty serious. And that's why there's an urgency for all Christians to be, to get into being, to being the children of God, to being caught up with the will of God. And, and living for the kingdom, to be who Christ has meant us to be, and that is to be a people who reflect his glory to the nations. To be or not to be, that is the question. How is it with us today? Well, just thinking of um, the, the verses we're going to look at this morning are Ephesians 5, 15 to 18, uh, no, seven, yeah, 15 to 18, and we'll get into, God willing, the other verses um, next week. But um, when I look at these verses, I love how they're preceded by verse 14. And Ephesians 5, 14 says, For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's what it means to be. We have to be awakened. We need to be alive and for Christ to shine on us. And this morning we're going to be looking at three to be statements. Oh, uh, to be, we need to be careful. We need to be knowing and we need to be filled. And that comes out of the verses of Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. So hopefully um, God will speak to us and help us to consider how it is we are to be as God's people. So let's start off by turning to Ephesians 5, chapter 15. And I'll just read the first part of it. It says, Therefore, be careful how you walk. Now the Bible's not talking about physical walk, of course it's not, right? You need to be careful how you physically walk. This is talking about our spiritual walk. We need to be careful how we walk spiritually. Um, so that means in terms of how we live our life, where we go and what we do, we ought to be careful. I wonder if we even think about that. As we live our Christian life, how many of us have in our minds the thought of, be careful, you meant to. You're meant to be careful as you live life. Do you realise that? We need to be careful. Because it's so easy to fall and fade away as a Christian. It's so easy to, to go down dead ends and dangerous paths in our Christian life. And so the Apostle Paul tells us, be careful. Be careful how you walk as a Christian. Now, as I thought about this, I thought, man, my brain is filled with all sorts of thoughts from some of my adventurous walks that I have done in life and the many times when I've had to be careful. Now, I, just, I did think of one. I remember going on a mission trip to the Pilbara with a group from Bassendine and um, after the mission trip we decided to drop into Karagini. Oh, that's a great place to explore. So we went to Karagini National Park. I don't know if you've been there. It's a great place. 
And I decided to take the group, which involved two of my daughters, into Handrail Pool. That's pretty easy to get into. We got there, it's magnificent, really magnificent. But I noticed that Handrail Pool continued around the corner. And this is before there were any signs, let me tell you this. No signs were up, because there were signs up to say, don't go any further. So being adventurous, I thought I'd take the group around the corner. And blow me down, it got really dangerous. And so I was thinking, should I stop or not? No, we'll keep going. Just be careful. So I was very careful with the group and we looked after each other. Freezing cold water, high sort of uh, rock things. And then we get to the very end of the gorge and there's an 80 metre drop into another gorge. Unbelievable. Wisdom kicked in then. Don't go any further. No abseiling. No, nothing else. All right. But I was thinking of, um, and, and no one died in it. Everyone had a great time, so it was all good. But we had to be careful because if I wasn't careful, some of us could have got hurt. And so it's so important. But as we live our Christian life, if we are Christians, we have to be careful how we walk, where we go, what we do. And so many Christians are not very careful at all. So we need to uh, be aware of this. So when it comes to um, being careful, we need to be careful in all sorts of things. We need to be careful in terms of uh, what we watch on TV, uh, what things that we are reading, uh, the sort of people we are hanging out with. Are they influencing us in a bad way? We need to be careful. There are so many things that in life can, can take hold of us and, and affect us and cause us to fall away from the faith, to stumble and to fall. <coughs> But also, I want to bring out here, in the next part of verse 15, it says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. So in being careful, we are to be wise. So we have to be wise. I was wise when I came up to that cliff face, you know, like that drop, 80 metre drop, and said, no, better not go any further. That's wise, eh? I don't know if I was wise, though, going beyond handrail pool. But we do learn. It's good to be wise. And when I think about wisdom, surely we should all know, or most of us should know, that one of the key things about being a wise person in this world, according to the book of Proverbs, is to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I tell you what, if you have a good dose of the fear of the Lord, that's going to help you be wise and walk carefully in our world. I want to bring out a verse in our New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 helps us to know that what the fear of the Lord should look like. We are to revere the Lord. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so when I think of that, one day I'm going to stand before Jesus. And I won't stand before Jesus to be judged for my sins, Praise the Lord for that because he's forgiven us and they've all been washed clean but we will be giving an account of our life to Jesus and that ought to make us be careful how we live, that we live well, we live wisely. We need to revere the Lord. Another thing we need to do is trust in the Lord. That's another great wisdom thing. Don't trust in yourself. Have you worked that out yet? You blow it if you do that. Be careful trusting others around you, but trust in the Lord because he is faithful and true. And there's some great verses on that. Two verses for me that are special. Psalm 62 and verse 8 says, Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart, O people, before him. God is a refuge for us. Aren't they, aren't they lovely words? Trust in, in him at all times. And Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, oh, many of us know that one, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So this is being wise and this helps us be careful. But also we are to be wise by praying to the Lord and reading his word day by day. And when I 
When we do those things, God lights up that good path for us to walk in, that right path that's going to help us be careful as we navigate through life. And there's a few verses that come to mind when I think of that. Psalm 119, verse 105. That's a big psalm, that one. That's why it's 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What is the word? The Lord's word. The Lord's word is a lamp to my feet. And the other one is Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. And I love these words. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient path where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. Isn't that a lovely verse? So we need to look to the Lord that he might direct us and guide us through the word and through prayer, that we might find that right path, the good path, and that's going to help us be careful as we live our life here on earth. But now I just want to um, pick out the next verse, verse 16, which is all connected to verse 15. I'll read 15 and 16. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise people but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Making the most of your time. Now I love that. If you think of just that phrase, be careful, you might think, well, to be careful in our world, maybe I should just um, be in a commune. Like just stay at home like we did in COVID. Just lock all the doors and stay at home. Or or maybe, you know, I, I just go into my spiritual bed. No, that's not the idea of being careful. Get out there. And do stuff, but be careful. It says make the most of your time. Not sleeping, but make the most of your time. And so we need to to get out into our world, be careful, but be active. Make the most of your time. What does that mean? That means like, like make sure your life counts. Make sure that you are engaged in the kingdom. Make the most of your time. What does that mean? To live fully for Christ and his kingdom. Just put away all the stuff that is just temporal, that is just a waste, that won't count for eternity. Make the most of your time. There was a man who did this so well. His name was C.T. Studd. And in 1913, he began the missionary organisation WEC. And in 1913, he left uh, some incredible things behind in order to pursue being a missionary, to live his life for Jesus fully. He happened to just be the English cricket captain. Nothing too high, really. Oh, that's terrible to say that. No, the English are okay. And, um, and also he had plenty of money he could have inherited, but he, he went away from all that. He went away from the English captaincy and he chose to live his life fully for Jesus. And I love the phrase he came up with. "'Tis only one life till soon be past. Only what's done for Jesus will last." You like that? Tis only one life till soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. That really captures what this is saying. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise people but as wise, making the most of your time. So I imagine for many of us, including myself, uh, we uh, so often are wasting uh, our life in things and we need to pick up on that and live our life purposely for Jesus. And also it says, make the most of your time because the days are evil. So what is, when I think about that, I think of how, how serious it is, the world we live in. We're living in dangerous times, evil times, and we need to be careful. And I don't know about you, but I know in my own life there have been people in our family and friends who have fallen away from the faith. They haven't been careful They have uh, neglected uh, fellowship. They've neglected um, reading the word of God. They have drifted away. They've been caught up in things. Other things have entered their life and they have drifted away and fallen away. And what heartache it is when that happens. And we have to be careful. The days we live in are dangerous days. The world's become treacherous, even our Western world. And as we live out there, it's so easy for this world to pull us down. And I want to read to you what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 to 11. Matthew 24, 9 to 11, Jesus says, 
then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will del deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. I emphasise the word there. What's the word? Many. That's what's so staggering. Jesus taught about the days before he came in back uh, on the great return of Jesus, there would be many who fall away. And when I think about that, no wonder I should take heed to what the Apostle Paul says under the power of the Spirit, be careful. Be careful how you walk. This is not just a playground. This is a dangerous place if we're not following Jesus. So we need to be careful. All right, let's now look at the second one. We are to be careful. The next point I want to bring out is in verse 17, be knowing. So verse 17 says, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be knowing. Knowing what? Knowing the will of the Lord. We've got to know that. Now, this will thing is so important. There are three big wills I want to bring out to you this morning. There is the will of yourself, your own will. That will is driven by your sinful nature. And that, desire, that sinful nature desires to control you and master you. It has a will, a strong will. Surely you should know this, being a human. And I can't help but think of the words of God to Cain when he's thinking about murdering his brother Abel. Man, it goes downhill really quickly in the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 6, or 4, sorry, Genesis chapter 4, 6 and 7, we read these words. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? What grace that God should come to Cain. Why are you angry? Why has your faith fallen? If you do well, will not your faith be lifted up? And if you do not do well, listen, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. That's a really important uh, passage to help us understand how we have a will that's seeking to master us but we are not to yield to it. In the New Testament, we are given hope to overcome uh, our will, the will that is to give in to the sinful nature. And it's Romans chapter 8, verse 13. It says, If you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us put to death uh, our sinful nature that's seeking to control us. But the other will is the will of the world. And the world's will is to, how would you summarise it? To conform us to this secular society that we live in. Don't you feel it? It's trying to conform you to this pattern that has been set by the media, by whoever. And we're immersed in it, aren't we? And so this is another powerful thing that is coming against us. So in the light of our own will that we're trying to assert that's coming from our sinful nature and the will of the world to conform us, and by the way, let me read Romans 12.2 because Romans 12.2 says about the world, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. The third one is the will of God. The will of God. And that's the thing that we are to be caught up with. We are to understand, we are to comprehend, we are to grasp the will of God. But how do you do that? How do we grasp and know the will of God? By the word of God. It's by the Holy Scriptures. And that's why there's no way any of us can know the will of God unless we are reading our Bible. You have to read the Bible to know the will of God. And especially reading the New Testament so that we can understand what it means to live for Jesus. And to read the Old Testament through the eyes of the New Testament, we need to read the Word of God. And that's how we come to know the general will of God for every Christian. But then we also have a specific will, don't we, we want? Is, is that right? When you're growing up and even now, uh, Robert and Shelley want to know the specific will of God for them in Mexico. And I need to know the specific will of God for my life in regards to what I should be doing. 
So yes, the, the general will of God tells me all about sharing the gospel and, and being like Jesus and loving my neighbour and uh, using my spiritual gifts. But the specific will of God are things like, Lord, what job should I do? Where should I study? All those things. How do you tap into that? Well, there's three things I would suggest to you. The Bible. It's amazing how God speaks to you through his word, even in your specific situation. Through prayer, praying and seeking the Lord. And it's amazing how he shapes your prayer and gives you a peace when you begin to settle on what his will is for you. And there's godly counsel. That's good too. Asking people who are godly and asking them for wisdom and advice. And these are the ways that we can come to know the will of God. You've got to know the will of God. It's so important. Be careful, but be knowing. And I want to just uh, read to you now from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. And the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossian church, he wasn't involved in uh, bringing the gospel to them, but when he heard that they had received the gospel through Epaphras, he wrote a letter. And the first thing that Paul prays for them is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. It's very interesting. He says, For this reason, since the day we heard of it, that is, coming to know Jesus, since the day we heard of this, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Top of the list. You've got to know it. Be careful, but know the will of the Lord and do it. Know the will of the Lord. All right, last point, be filled. And that's in verse uh, 18, be filled. Let's have a read of Ephesians 5 verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation or debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I love that. This is a great verse. Be filled with the Spirit. If that's the only thing you remember today, just remember that. That's what our desire should be, be filled with the Spirit. This is a great to be statement. To be careful, great. To be knowing, excellent. To be filled, it's everything. To be filled with the Spirit means to be filled with the Spirit of the Father. To be filled with the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's who the Spirit is. When we say the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son. And it's everything to be filled with the Spirit because the Spirit is the one who connects us to God. How cool is that? It's the Spirit who completes us in Christ. It's the Spirit who conforms us to the image of Jesus and it's the Spirit who, who makes us chock-a-block full of spiritual life, otherwise we're dead, spiritually dead. The Spirit is everything and we are to be filled with the Spirit. Otherwise we are asleep and we are dead spiritually. We're to be so full that our being is overflowing with him. And other people can see it. We're not talking about having a drop of the spirit or a half cup full of the spirit. We're talking about a full cup. Be filled with the spirit. This is a very big to be that we are to, to do. And when the Spirit is full in us, what we need to understand, and I will pick up on this, when we are filled with the Spirit, it means the same thing as being controlled by the Spirit. That is to say, every cell in your body, your mind and your emotions, your will, your heart, are under the control of the Holy Spirit. That is the most blessed state to be. O oh, to be, filled with the Spirit. Now, why did I mention the word control? Because that's the picture language given by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, 18. He says, don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. He gives this like weird illustration, you might even think, but there's a purpose in it. Don't get drunk with wine. What do we know about people who drink alcohol? Well, the alcohol controls them. As they get drunk, the spirits of the alcohol cause them to be under the influence or the control of the drink. We all know that. Well, Paul is using that example from the world to help us realise as Christians, you need your, the Holy Spirit to be full in you, to control you. Of course, for good, 
for that which is great and excellent. So that's what we need to do, to be filled with the Spirit. And how do we be filled with the Spirit? Is it a once-off experience? No. Is it something that happened uh, when you were converted and that's it, you don't have to worry about it anymore? No. No, it's not. It's something that needs to happen every day. And I wonder how many Christians understand this, every day. Going back to the illustration of a person who has been drinking alcohol and they're intoxicated, controlled by, this, by the uh, alcohol, we know that um, in that state it wears off and then they sober up. Right, well, that's, a, that's um, that illustration. Now back to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in you, we need to make sure that he continues to be full in us. And the only way practically that I know that happens in my own life is by every day, as I awaken, I remember who I have become. I've become Christ. He gave his life for me and died for me. And I yield my life to God afresh every day. I give my life to him. I open my life to him. And every day, God's spirit fills me anew. This is the practice of every Christian it's meant to be. And that's how it's got to be. Every day I am to remind myself of who Jesus is and I give my life to him. I surrender my life to him every day. It's not a one-off thing that I did when I was 18 years of age, when I first became a Christian. It's something that I would do every day because I want him to fill me, to live in me in all his power and beauty. In John chapter 15, Jesus said something that also helps me understand all this. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus pictures himself as the vine and we are the branches. And I I know it doesn't say this here, but I picture the Holy Spirit as being like the sap that flows from the vine into the branches. And we know if, if a branch is not connected to the vine, the branch will wither. The branch will die. It's our job to be connected to Christ, to be grafted into him, that his life, the spirit of Jesus, might flow through us every day. It takes um, effort on our part, a commitment on our part, a dedication to Jesus every day, a submission to him every day for this to happen. So what happens? So many Christians, they start off well and there's no continual filling of the spirit they're drifting drifting lower and lower till there's barely a flicker in their life and they cannot be careful when they in when they live in this world because they've forgotten what it means to be careful and they don't know the will of the lord and they're in a very dangerous place of falling away from christ but all along there is the spirit of jesus the beautiful spirit of jesus to help us to fill us to control us and guide us now, because I'm of its proximity to another verse, I want to share how important it is to be filled with the Spirit, but, but we need to also be careful of what we read earlier. Um, a few, um, about a month ago, we looked at this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 to 32. We need to be careful of sin, because sin does something. It says in verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So in order to be filled with the Spirit, we need to be careful not to grieve the Spirit. How do you grieve the Spirit? By committing sin and by not confessing or repenting of our sin. And so I urge you to make sure you keep short accounts with God. We all sin. But ask the Lord to forgive you straight away and seek his forgiveness so that you might no longer continue to grieve the Spirit. Because if you grieve the Spirit, then you're going to not be filled with the Spirit. And another one I want to throw in is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-20. 
And that says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. And what that means is, we need to say yes to God when he's speaking to us, yes to him when we read his word, and not quench the spirit who's trying to speak to us. We need to listen to the Lord. So if we can minimise the quenching and the grieving of the spirit and open our heart to the Lord in full surrender, we will know the filling of the spirit. And Bazo Church would be alive. We will be. You'll be alive. We'll be alive. These are key things to the Christian life. I've got to tell you that there's so many Christians who haven't understood these sort of things. We're still caught up in the, what we call the milk of the word of how we have been forgiven of our sins and how we will go to heaven because of Jesus. But God wants you to be moved further than that. He wants you to see the glorious gospel working its way out of our life where we are alive in Christ for the glory of his name. And this is where it's so important to be. To be or not to be, that is the question. Are we going to be people who are being, who Christ purchased us to be? Are we going to be careful? Are we going to be knowing the will of God and are we going to be filled with the Spirit? Friends, it's so exciting living in the days we are in, but may the Lord help us to walk well and to really shine his light in the days we live in. And we're going to sing a special song now. We don't sing it that often. And it's a song that says, Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. It's a beautiful song. It's a prayer. So let's stand and sing this together as we close. That's a lovely song. Beautiful prayer. I pray that you can own those words. So let me just say before I close, let's be uh, careful in how we walk. Let's be knowing the will of the Lord. Get into the Bible. And let's be filled with the Spirit. That requires surrender. Surrender during the day. Surrender in the morning when you awaken. Surrender to the Lord Jesus and he will fill you with his Spirit. And Father, thank you for the 
the wonderful gift of the Spirit too. I know only a little while ago we remembered the birth of the church and the coming of the Spirit for the first time. And we thank you that he has come to be permanently in us, which is an amazing thing. No longer do we need to pray that prayer that David prayed uh, when he said, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Thank you for your incredible grace to allow your Spirit to be in us. But Lord, we pray that he might be filling us, full in us because we surrender our life to Jesus. We're not living a half-hearted life or a, a, a combination life, one foot in the world and one foot in your kingdom. Pray, Lord, that our hearts would be sincere and they would be surrendered to your son Jesus and that you might fill us every day with your spirit and lead us and guide us. I ask for all of us here, Lord, especially in the light of some of my own family and friends who have fallen away from the faith, that you would help us to be careful in the way we live. Please would you protect us and help us to be knowing the good will of yours, that good, pleasing and perfect will. Please help us, Lord, because our own will is dangerous and the will of this world is trying to conform us to its image. Help us to know the good will you have for us. May our lives be lived purposefully for the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord, for Ephesians and the things that we've been looking at over recent weeks. A lot of challenging things here. And, Lord, sometimes it can be overwhelming. So may your Holy Spirit help us to know what we need to work on. And thank you for the grace and the power and the strength, the comfort and the encouragement that we have from you, our God and Father, as we live this life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.